All right, let's continue on here. Let's um, look at beam expansion in a different light here. Okay, so again, you're going to use beam expanders numerous times in this course, and you're going to get really good at assembling them. This week it's going to be a little bit more difficult because it's the first time. And I want to remind you that as you assemble your beam expander, just like we did in the first week's lab, you should be able to reverse the laser beam back through them into the laser, just like the first week. If you can't do this, you do not have a good beam expander. So every time we do stuff in this lab, you should be able to reverse the optical system completely back to the laser with a mirror at the end and have it go right back into the laser as a pinhole size the same at the, that the laser came out with. If you can't do that, you haven't done good alignment, okay? And do the same thing we talked about too, where you basically add a component and you try to reverse the system. Now, I want to look at beam expanders in term, in, in also in terms of one of their applications, which is to reduce beam divergence, meaning how much is a laser beam spread out over distance, okay? So let me explain this a little bit further here. What I want you first to consider is the smallest diameter D naught that you could focus a beam down to, okay? And you can calculate that as follows. Here's the smallest diameter that you could focus a laser beam down to for a given wavelength and a half angle size, meaning that this is the half angle of the full angle that you're trying to focus it down to, okay? The beam that you see here below, here it comes in, this is a versus distance, and this is uh, the, the diameter measured here, basically. It goes down, it focuses, and then it diverges again. In this case, you can see based on the positioning here that this is highly divergent because they try to focus this thing down only to about 100 to 200 microns. It's about two human hairs across. And as a result, after they focus it down, it diverges like crazy. That makes sense. If you look at the equation here, if I try to make, because, well, if lambda is constant, that's my wavelength of light I'm using, if I try to make this small, then theta has to be larger. That's the divergence, right? Conversely, if I make the diameter really large, then theta will have to go down to keep this constant, and I have less divergence. So again, if the d theta product is a constant, then if we want a beam that is less divergent, then you must expand it. And so if I want to measure the divergence over distance, I can use this equation. This says that the diameter squared at any position z, so way out here past the point you start here, is equal to the original diameter, d naught right here, plus my divergence angle, theta, in radians, by the way, units of radians, at the distance z squared. So as I go further and further distance z squared, my diameter is getting bigger. Okay, and that's what this equation says basically. Now let's do a calculation. In this lab, our laser is a 633 nanometer laser, and as the laser exits the, the, the laser itself, it has a D naught of about one millimeter. Okay? And so I'll put that D naught in here, being about one millimeter, okay? And I'm going to put it, actually, I'm going to put it in this equation. So D naught is one millimeter in this equation over here, okay? I know that my wavelength is 633 nanometers, so I'll put that in here, okay? So I'll put that in the lambda, and I've got four out front, divided by pi, no problem. I'll solve for theta, and I will find that theta in radians is 0 0.8 milliradians, or about 0 0.05 degrees of divergence with distance, okay? So, why is this important? Well, imagine you're trying to do laser communications with the moon. If you took the laser we have in the lab and you shined it at the moon, then you could find by the time you get to the moon, the diameter, given the distance to the moon, which is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters, okay, times the divergence, which is only 0.8 milliradians, so I'll put it in here, I'm going to get rid of d naught because you'll find that this part of the equation is huge. In fact, you'll find that your final D is 304 kilometers across. So by the time this laser gets to the moon, it would be 304 kilometers in diameter. Not very useful. So why do we do beam expanders? Well, look what happens. Again, if you expand the beam at Earth to one meter, increase D naught, theta goes down, right? And you recalculate this, you'll find that by basically making it expanded on Earth, then sending it to the moon, 
When it gets to the moon, it'll only be 304 meters across, which is a thousand times smaller than if you didn't expand the beam first. So the key point is beam expanders are useful because if you ex also, because when you expand the beam, it has less divergence and you can get that optical signal somewhere actually at a smaller spot size than trying to start with a really tiny, narrow laser beam instead. It's counterintuitive, but that's the way it works out. Um, so now I'll bring in inter reintroduce ray transfer matrices. Remember when we talked about ray transfer matrices, they can become very convenient when you have a system where you build up multiple optimal elements. You just basically multiply out the ray transfer matrices for each element, and that gives you the difference between the input parameters and the output parameters where you can have multiple lenses, prisms, whatever you want in here. And if you recall, the, the ray transfer matrix for a positive lens was as follows. This is 1 over f, which is the focal length of the, uh, of the lens. Now, this is for a positive lens. This week, I'm going to ask you to figure out that what do you do for a negative lens? Could it be that you just take this same ray transfer matrix and you put a negative value for f in there? And so you'll determine that, and you'll also use these. Once you figure that out, you'll use this to verify your experiment, experimental results this week. So let's do a simple ray transfer matrix calculation now. So let's consider an object like we did last week at a distance d from a lens with a focal length f. So this should, should start to make even more sense this week. So basically, here's my ray transfer matrix for the focal length, for, I mean for the positive lens. Here's my ray transfer matrix for having an object at a distance d from where I want to reobserve the light. There is a ray transfer matrix for that. And I multiply these out pretty simple. So if I want this element here, it's this times this, okay? And of course, this element here is this times this. This element here is this times this. And this element here is this times this. I add them all and I get my new ray transfer matrix, which is for this combined system of moving a distance d and having a positive lens here f. So let's do a simple calculation and see if it actually works out. So let's assume that we will basically try to figure out y2 theta 2 here for the output of the system. If I start at y1 equals 0 right here on the z-axis, okay, and my theta 1 is 15 degrees or 0.26 radians. So I'll start right here at y equals 0 and 15 degrees here. Okay. For this system, I'll assume my lens has a focal length of 50 millimeters. Okay, and let's we'll finish the calculation here. So remember, when we do ray tra transfer matrices, it basically transfers an input by virtue of multiplying by the matrix into an output. And so I'll multiply my input values times the ray transfer matrix. So this times this equals this. Then all I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute in my values here. So I'll substitute in y1, which is zero. I substitute in D, which we said it would be a distance of 50 millimeters starting here for D from the focal length, substitute in for D. And I'll substitute in theta 1 in units of radians, though, not degrees, so I put radians in there. And I'll also have to put down in here my focal length, which I gave you as well. I substitute that all in, and it says that my output has a value of theta 1 equals 0 and y1 equals 13 millimeters. Let's see if that makes sense. I'm sorry y2 equals 13 millimeters and theta 2 equals 0. Not, that was my input, here's my output. And so, let's see if that makes sense. Well, here I have my input, here's my lens, and if I'm going at this angle, of course I would expect to be up higher here at a height of 13 millimeters, so that makes sense. And notice my angle goes to 0. Let's see if that makes sense. Well, this if my angle here is 0 degrees, that means my light rays are parallel to the z-axis, right? They're all they're all parallel and they're all parallel lines. Well, notice what we did here. We basically put our distance d the same at the focal length, right? So we started out here at the focal point. Well, that makes sense because if I go backwards, parallel lines all trace back to the focal point, and so I would expect this to be a parallel line because it's starting here at the focal point and then to come out parallel here. So this makes complete sense and it's showing a simple calculation with ray transfer matrices. 
Now, I've talked about positive lenses, I've talked about negative lenses, there are many other types of lenses. This is a biconvex, convex on both sides, plano convex, meaning convex on one side, planar on the other. This is convex concave. This is called a meniscus, same curvatures on both sides, like the meniscus of the soap bubble maybe. Plano concave, biconcave. So I didn't do the calculations of focal lengths for these. How would you do it? Well, simple. You just use the lens maker equation here and you substitute in your radius of curvature. So if you have a lens that has a, you know, if you have a lens that has a negative and a positive curvature to it for both different sides, like a convex concave one, like this one, just put them both in there. And if you know the refractive index of the glass, it will give you the right focal length. So that's all you gotta do, okay? And remember, for negative surfaces, the radius of curvature is negative, and for positive surfaces, the radius of curvature is positive, okay? Now, another way to create a lens is something called a Fresnel lens here, where you basically take the curvature you have out here, and you impart it on a surface, but then you reset it back down, as you can see here. So light coming through here would see pretty much most of the surface being curved as it would with a regular lens, but you're able to make the lens much flatter than you would with the big, the thick lens. One of the key drawbacks is that any light that gets refracted here near these edges will get scattered in directions you don't intend. So, that's, it's great because you can make larger lenses which are flat without having a huge piece of glass, and that might give you a clue what this is here. You have a bunch of Fresnel lenses here, and this is actually a lighthouse tower where you've got these huge lenses on the walls to focus the light, and you could never do it with a pure glass lens. They'd just be enormous. The cost to make them would be huge, and they'd weigh a ton. So instead, they make Fresnel lenses, which are more like windows, which have the exact same effect. Okay, again, take a break, and then we'll have one more lecture, and we're done.